right. Well, good morning. Welcome to Mission Hills. It's great to see everybody. I got to admit to you today that I am a little tired. I spent yesterday morning watching over and over and over the royal wedding, right? <laughs> and so Prince Harry and I have a couple things in common. Uh, first of all, Harry and I both got our princesses, right? The second thing Carrie and I are a little different on is the 43 million bank, right, on the wedding. Yeah, pretty crazy, isn't it? And it just goes to show if I would have invited George Clooney to my wedding, I probably would have upped the ante, but just didn't have the opportunity, right? Well, hey, take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to get right into it today. And I think one of the epic stories... Uh, of the Bible. I think if we traveled around the world and could pull people and say, hey, what are the biggest stories of the Bible? Daniel in the lion's den is probably in the bucket list, right? It's one of the big rocks. And as you turn to Daniel chapter 6, there's a Bible in front of you if you don't have one or turn to your, take your smartphone and turn to Daniel chapter 6. I've got a question for you this morning. Why is it now after three kings that Daniel's being sought after? Why after three kingdoms is Daniel still being promoted? The guy's 80 years old now on the scene. And after three kingdoms, it could have been easily, he could have just been put kind of in the archives and said he was kind of one of those guys that helped the king a a few generations ago. But after three kings, Daniel is consistently being promoted and sought after. And in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible says it this way, that Daniel distinguished himself among others. How? Because his excellent capabilities. In other words, Daniel continually kept the top priority of his life, the name and the fame of God. He wanted to honor God above all things and had this courageous conviction to stand for what was right. And how do we know this? Because in 2018, over 4,000 years past the time that Daniel was walking this planet Earth, we're still talking about the guy today because he had excellent capabilities. He did his job with excellence. And again, I think if there's one theme verse that could kind of thread throughout the book of Daniel, and especially in Daniel chapter 6, it's the wisdom of Solomon that says in Proverbs 21.1, in the Lord's hands, a king's heart is like a stream of water. And he channels towards all who please him. And you're going to see in Daniel chapter 6, this King Darius become to rise to power, and he begins to watch Daniel's life, and he begins to watch Daniel's God, and you're going to see a transformation begin to happen in the chapter of Daniel's chapter 6, because in the Lord's hands, a king's heart is like a channel of water. Pray with me. Father, I pray today that you would open our eyes and our mind and especially your heart to your words today. They are reliable. They are true. And so bring that truth to us today and change our lives as we read the book of Daniel together. Father, we thank you for this man's life and the principles of his life, that he had a courageous conviction to honor you. Amen. So in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says this, it, is pleased, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So 120 people were under Daniel. Daniel was seen somewhat as a prince under King Darius. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the entire kingdom. Now, in Daniel chapter 6, 2, there's a statement there that I want us to lean in on and understand, so that the king might not suffer loss. It's an interesting statement. It does not mean loss of money or personal bodyguard or even make me look good. Now, that's all included in this text. But it was anything that would bring harm to the king and his kingdom. Daniel and the, the other two administrators were being asked to help the king and his kingdom succeed. Now, understand the context of where Daniel is at this time. At 80 years of age, where he is, he's thriving in Babylon. He's consistently being promoted. The kings are seeking his advice. But listen, this isn't the church that Daniel's a part of. It's not a parachurch organization that Daniel's a part of. It's not even the Jewish government. 
Daniel's being asked to help a king and a kingdom succeed that is not following God. In fact, Darius was seen as a god, as one of the gods of the Medes and Persians. And he's not, Daniel's not working for God's people at all, but being tasked to help them succeed. And he does it so well that he's being promoted. A couple years ago, a TV show came on the scene. It was called uh, Undercover Boss. Anybody who's watched that show? It's a great show. And by the end, even it makes a grown man start like welling up with tears, right? But essentially what it is is this, is high-level corporate executives leave the comfort of their offices and window views, and they secretly take low-level jobs within their company to find out how things really work and what their employees truly think of them. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't that be fun to do? Maybe, right? Especially if you've got one of the low-level jobs and you get to work with, find out that you've worked with the exec for the week. But if you're an executive, to find out what people really think of you down on the lower levels, right? Well, the CEO of a huge hotel in Vegas, Las Vegas, decided to do just that. He takes the challenge of undercover boss. And so he goes undercover and they disguise himself and put different hair and a mustache on him. And he gets hired in at the lowest level. And he begins to work with people doing the same monotonous job day in and day out. And he begins to work with a particular woman. And he begins to hear story after story of this woman named Rita. And what's interesting about Rita is this. She works hard, was always positive, and had tremendous influence with other people that she worked with. She did the job with excellence. And after he attempted to poke fun at her boss, just to see kind of what she was made of. So he kind of comes in and starts being cynical and sarcastic against this big, ginormous hotel in Vegas, right? But she would not take the bait. She continued to do her job with excellence and do what was right time and time and time again continually doing what was right and with honor. What he discovered was that Rita's job was this. After years and years of doing this, day in out and day in and day out, she would take the bedding off of hundreds of hotel rooms, wash the sheets, and remake those same beds. Day in and day out, day after day. She had done this for years, not complaining with excellence, all the while making a positive impact on those around her. As a result... The CEO of this huge hotel gave Rita her first promotion in years and put her overseer over the entire housekeeping department in this large hotel. Why? Because she distinguished herself and she had excellent qualifications with her employees. And that is the theme of Daniel chapter 6, that Daniel honored Darius with excellence, and because of his work ethic, his pursuit of God, his influence grew. You see, there's a principle here. When we honor others with excellence, it will often lead to an increase in our influence. When we honor excellence with no strings attached, it often will lead to an increase in our influence. Think about this. What if we pursued excellence to those in authority over us? You are known as the best employee in your company. You are known as the best student in your school, the best neighbor in your cul-de-sac, the best athlete, the best friend that people in authority over you have ever heard of. To honor them with excellence. Thinking, think of the lasting impact that you would have if you were known as that employee in your company. Look at verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, well, guess what? We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with his faith unless it has something to do with his law of his God. The question that I have for us this morning is this, what if my courageous conviction to Jesus Christ was the only thing people could use against me? Allow that to sink in today. In your company, 
with your friendships, as a student in, as in your school, with your coaches, with the people you interact with, maybe in your family? What if your courageous conviction to Jesus Christ was the only thing people could use against you? But I believe at times in my life and in most of our lives in this room today, it's not about our courageous conviction to Jesus Christ that has hurt us. It's been our lapse of integrity and, and competence. We were criticized, we were written up, we were put on probation, we weren't able to run out with the team or maybe benched, and yes, even let go from our companies because we were poor employees. We played the Jesus card, and we, honor, we felt like we honored Jesus. But guess what? Somewhere in our, our equation of life, we became sarcastic. We became cynical, and we did not do our jobs with excellence. And so there was fault found in us. We were outspoken for Jesus Christ, but we were a poor employee. Imagine the leverage we would have in our companies, in our schools, with our families, with our coaches, with our teachers, our neighbors, and even our friends, if our allegiance to Jesus Christ were the only thing that they could use against us. You see, folks, listen to me today. In the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the world, it is not our relationship with Jesus Christ that matters. It is our resemblance of him. As people watch our life, and we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, there should be a drastic difference in what we do and how we do it. How we treat our spouses, how we treat our kids, doing our jobs with excellence, so that the only thing they can use against us is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that said of you today? Is that said of me today? In verse 6, the story goes on. So the administrators and trade traps went as a group to the king, and they said this, May King Darius live forever. That's now been said three times in the book of Daniel at each different king when they're trying to plot and set up Daniel, right? The royal administrators, prefects, trade traps, advisors, and governors have all agreed, we've all signed on and off on this king, that the king should issue this edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, your majesty, shall be thrown into the den of lions. Now, your majesty, issue this decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king Darius put the decree into writing. Ah, the amazing work of art called flattery, right? King, we have all lined up, and we believe that you are the greatest king over the nation of Babylon. You do things exceedingly well. King, we honor you. We love you. We love being a part of your cabinet. And King, do this for us, because you're seen as like a god to the Medes and Persians. Create this law. That if anybody does not worship you, if anybody does not pray to you alone, then let's take them off the map. Let's throw them in the den of lions. You see, when we listen and accept flattery, it will compromise our convictions. And that's exactly what happened in King Darius' life. I believe that King Darius got all the governors and satraps and all these nobles in his throne room, and they began to honor him and flatter him and say, oh, king, live forever. You are the best king. And Darius began to feed into that, feed into that flattery and begin to accept that flattery. And as the law was played down in front of him, he took that pen and he signed it and got the pictures with all those nobles, right? And then he put that pen down. And I believe it hit him, what he had just done. He just destroyed his best employee. The guy that was sought after after three kingdoms, the guy that he knew about of Daniel, right? He had just put a law into the fact that would destroy his life. Now, I don't know if Darius was full of pride or insecurity. We don't know that. But what we do know is from the text is that he was listening and accepting flattery. You see, understand the religious traditions in Persia at this time was where a king was seen as a divine representative of the gods. Darius was seen to the people of the Mers and Persians uh, nation as a god, and people prayed to him. 
They were telling him, we totally see how great you are. We're just concerned, O King Darius, that not everybody sees that. Wink, wink, right? I've got an idea, though, King, that if those people don't recognize you, let's just wipe them out. And Darius falls for it. He ends up compromising his convictions and signing off on a law that places his best employee in the line of fire. Now look what happens in verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, in other words, when Daniel learned that Darius, his good friend, had signed off on this law, you know what he does? He stops his account on Facebook. He goes home and he shuts the door. He turns off his cell phone. He unplugs his Wi-Fi. He gets under his bed and he thinks, for 30 days, I'm going to wait this out. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm not going to let them know I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to answer the door if they come to the door. I'm going to park my car in the garage for a change and not let any Anybody know I'm home? Absolutely the opposite. Look what Daniel does. He goes home, goes to his upstairs room where it's very visible, where the windows open towards Jerusalem. He opens his windows, right? And three times a day, he gets down on his knees and he prays. And he makes the name and fame of God his top priority. And the Bible says it this way, just as he had done before. There was nothing different about his life because he had not compromised his convictions. Then these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying. You see, they're feeding off each other. Let's watch. Let's all go to Daniel's house and see who he is going to choose. Either he's going to choose Darius or he's going to choose his boss or he's going to choose God, right? Let's watch him. And they ask, and, the, and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. And now they're reminding the king. The king already knows what he's done, what he's set in motion. But now this whole group has just found out that Daniel has been praying to Jerusalem with his windows open. And now we're all going to come and, and, and confirm that. And they come back to the king and they said, Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone... Anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den. Didn't, didn't you do this, king? I mean, it says anyone on, on this law. The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Your majesty, he does not pay attention to you or the decree you putting in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, the Bible says he was greatly distressed. Now, what's interesting about this section of verses is this. What did Daniel do? He opens his windows. Where does he open his windows and where does he pray? He faces towards Jerusalem. His face was set towards the city of Jerusalem, the city of his God not towards the city of Babylon. You see, most of the world begin their days with their face towards the world, hoping to see what they can gain from it. But Daniel, listen to this, as a follower of Christ, our face needs to be pointed towards Jesus, his ways, his words, and we enter each new day in faith. Daniel had walked with God for more than 80 years and knew that he would not fail him now. God helped him stand when everyone else bowed under King Nebuchadnezzar. God saved his life by interpreting a dream for that same king. God delivered his best friends from being torched in the furnace. And if you look ahead to Daniel 9, verse 2, it says something pretty profound in that verse that Daniel had with him the prophecy of the prophet Jeremiah. He had the Old Testament scriptures of the prophet Jeremiah in his hands. So Daniel, guess what? Read the scripture that said this, I am the Lord, the God of all humanity, Is there anything too difficult for me? A courageous conviction knows that private dedication will fuel public courage. You see, Daniel's private dedication fueled his public courage. And I want to ask this morning, what are you doing in private that is fueling your public courage? Are you spending time alone with God 
in, in reading absolute truth of the Scriptures and renewing your mind day in and day out so that you can have that public courage to stand and not compromise your convictions. That's how we thrive as followers of Jesus Christ in this world where there is convictions being compromised all the time. We stand because we have a courageous conviction to rely on God's word as the source of our strength. And that's what Daniel is doing here. The Bible goes on to say this, then the men went as a group to the King Darius and said to him in verse 15, remember your majesty that according to the law that you set in motion, the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said one last statement to Daniel. Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. It was kind of his last statement to Daniel before he sent him off to be executed. Verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. Then the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Again, the law of the Medes and Persians, once a king set that law into motion, history tells us, it could not be changed. There was no way a human, it was humanly possible now to go against that, that law. The king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep because he knew it was now humanly impossible to change what was set in motion. It was done. It was over. Humans had done everything they possibly could, and there was no way to save Daniel. You see, history would tell us that there was two types of ways to torture people with lions. The first one is kind of like the movie Gladiator. If you've seen the movie Gladiator, right? And they put Christians in this big arena and, or people that went against the government or, or went against the kings or were thieves or burglars. They would put them in, the, in this arena and, and then thousands of people would come out for entertainment, kind of like a college football team, a college football game, right? But people would actually walk away. But they would Thousands and thousands of people would come and watch these gladiators fight. And then, you know, they would put the Christians into this arena and then these lions would attack them and devour them. And the second form of persecution for Christians or people that went against the government or kings of that day, they would use the pit of lions. And it was actually a deep pit. And in, if you would look down into that pit, there was two sides with a stone wall between. One side was where the food would be kept, and the other side was where the den of lions would be kept. And they would take those lions, and they would torture those lions and beat those lions, and, and most of the time not feed them until someone was put on the other side or food was put on the other side. And to make those lions intentionally ferocious and angry. So when that food was dropped into the other side of that wall and that stone wall went up, those lions devoured whatever was on the other side. And so as Darius walks back to his palace that night, he begins to hear that stone wall being brought up. And he knows the outcome of the story. He knows that in a matter of moments, his good friend, his top employee, the person that had helped his pedigree of kings was going to be destroyed. In fact, the Bible says it this way. If you look in Daniel chapter 6, verse 24b, and before they reached the floor of the den, what happened, what the lions do with the people? The lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. And Darius knew that's what was going to happen. And so he said one last time, Daniel, I'm so sorry. And I hope your God can rescue you. There's nothing more I can do. And look what happens in verse 21. Or excuse me, in verse 19, that the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den of lions, he calls out to Daniel in an anguished voice, O Daniel, servant of the living God, in essence, are you still alive? Daniel, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue from the lions? Daniel, are you still there? 
And I believe following behind King Darius with all his nobles and his satraps and his governors, they're following along and they're kind of hitting each other and they're thinking, I don't know what he's screaming about. This deal is over. Like this guy was devoured. All we're going to hear is the purring of some cats, right? Because they got a great meal in this guy named Daniel. It's done. It's over. I don't know why he's yelling. And in verse 21, his God comes through. May the king live forever, Daniel answered. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything against you, O king, your majesty. Can you imagine now the governors and the satraps and the nobles and everyone following the king? When now once they heard Daniel's voice, they went, oh no, this isn't going to be good. And sure enough, what happens? The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the pit. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound, no scratch was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And at the king's commands, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. This was such a big deal. No one was going to be left in that family. No pedigree, no legacy was ever going to be left of the people who had stood against Daniel and stood against Daniel's God and ultimately stood against Darius. We're going to wipe the entire family out. And they threw them all into the lion's den. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And again we see in Proverbs 21.1, In the hands of the Lord, the king's heart, the core of his being is like a stream of water. Look what Darius does. And the king wrote to all the nations and people of every language in all of the earth, may you prosper greatly. And in verse 26, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and revere the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. Psalms 92 is pretty much a parallel right there. He is the living God, and his love endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You see, God can cause unbelievers to acknowledge his greatness by how you and I honor him and how you and I honor others. Darius' life was like the stream of water in the hands of the Lord, and his life began to change over the course of Daniel chapter 6, and he began to revere and follow God at the end, to acknowledge that Daniel's God was the true God. And if we could say one thing about Daniel chapter 6, it would be this, that we thrive when we have a courageous conviction to honor God and to honor others. We thrive. We will thrive in a culture that is more and more increasingly coming against the ways and the works of Jesus Christ. We can thrive in that when we have a courageous conviction to stand for what is right even when the, when the trumpet sounds, everyone else begins to fall and bow towards Babylon. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, will point our faces towards Jerusalem and say that I will follow Jesus Christ regardless of what our culture says. I will stand for what is right. I will stand and do my job with excellence because people are watching my life and I will not compromise my convictions And we can have a courageous conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit to honor God and to honor others. A season is coming here in the fall that's one of my favorite seasons. It's college football. Can't wait. The only two, really, the only three things we have in Nebraska really are the Huskers, Warren Buffett, and the College World Series. So college football is a big deal for us. And a number two kind of close second of the Nebraska Cornhuskers is Clemson University, Dabo Sweeney. Here's a couple things you may not know about Dabo. Dabo's uh, obviously the football coach at the University of Clemson. There he is holding his beautiful trophy. 
In 2016, he was the national championship coach. And, it, and here's what's amazing. He has a truly crazy story. Dabo is the product of a broken home with an alcoholic father. He was a teenager when his family lost their home to foreclosure. And during his freshman year at the University of Alabama, while walking onto the football team, Dabo's mother had to come with him to campus. Not to visit, but to live with his son, live with her son. You know why? She had, she had no longer had a home. She had no place to go. And so Sweeney was sharing a room with his mom and another student in a tiny apartment because she wanted her son to experience his dream of playing college football. He earned a scholarship to play for Alabama and was part of the 92 national championship team. Soon after, he began a coaching career that ultimately put him at the helm in 2008 of one of college football's storied programs. Oh, and by the way, Dabo Sweeney is a very, very outspoken follower of Jesus Christ. Just a few years ago, during which he established himself as one of football's elite coaches, but guess what? His faith and his job at Clemson University came under extreme attack. He landed in the crosshairs of an anti-religious organization that threatened lawsuits, his job, and began personal attacks against not only he, but his wife and his kids, and against the University of Clemson. Clemson, they wrote a letter to Clemson University, and this uh, anti-religious organization said this, and I quote, your coach must cease, he must keep quiet, and he must retrain his coaches and his athletes against things that are unconstitutionally religious activities. He must retrain, he must keep quiet, and your coach must cease, or we're going to continue to put pressure on him until you fire him as Clemson University. But guess what? Dabo held firm. He prayed hard. And what is amazing? Clemson University, a secular public university, did what? They backed him. Why? Coach Dabo Sweeney, they said, has done nothing wrong. The accusations are false. Beyond the game of football, he continues to do the right things over and over and over again. He, begin, he continues to teach and lead our student athletes with excellence and is an outstanding employee for the University of Clemson. You see, we thrive when we have a courageous conviction to honor God and to honor others. Pray with me. Father, may it be said of us, Someday we will stand before you. We will stand and see eye to eye with you. And Daniel will stand and see you face to face. And King Nebuchadnezzar will see you face to face. And Belshazzar will see you face to face. And King Darius will see you face to face. And God, in that moment when our eyes meet, we want to hear the words, good job, faithful servant. You have followed me with excellence. You have honored our God. May that be said of us today. Amen.